All right, joining us this morning is the High Performance Manager at St Kilda, Matt Hornsby. Now, Matt spent a career uh, working with elite athletes in multiple sports, and it's a real pleasure to have you here, Matt. Thanks for joining us. No worries at all. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Now, joining me today is Martin Melody, our head of sport in the junior school, and together we're going to um, you know, hopefully give our boys a bit of an insight into what your role currently is and then a little bit about your career uh, up to you know, your current role. So I'll start with your, your younger days, Matt. Can you tell us a little bit about where you grew up, where you went to school, and what sports you played growing up? Yeah, sure. I was a pretty typical um, Melbourne lad growing up, and a um, uh, you know, family of five, and uh, lived in a dead end street, and so it was um, yeah cricket in the in the street uh, during the summer, and and it was uh, football uh, during the winter, and um, you know really enjoyed those days, and and always just had a genuine passion for sport, um, and would you know, be interested in pretty much any sport. Um, never achieved any great level of sport myself. Um, you know had a crack at most. Uh, activities and, and really loved it. Loved the team environment. Um, loved the physical nature of it, the competitiveness uh, of it. Um, and you know, once I realised that uh, I wasn't going to make it at any great level um, individually, I uh, was pretty keen to maintain that passion and work within elite sport. And you know, I've been really fortunate that. You know, for 20 plus years, I've I've worked with um, elite athletes, predominantly within the AFL industry. Yeah. So at that point, when you said, "Okay, well, I'm not going to be paid to play sport, but I want to be involved in professional sport," it takes more than just wanting that. So, what kind of education did you have, particularly after school, to get you know, I mean, your foot in the door? Yeah, I I, I think back on those times, and I had a couple of really important mentors that helped shape my um, approach to what ended up becoming a career and the first was my um, secondary school PE teacher who uh, was involved very part-time within AFL um, as a game day runner and some conditioning work before it became a full-time profession and he taught me an enormous amount uh, in regards to training athletes and understanding um, different running sessions and, and how they uh, can elicit a different response uh, physiologically with athletes. And um, uh, so he was a terrific mentor and, and I got started uh, working at VFL level and, and, you know, I would catch up with him even though I wasn't at school anymore and he would take me through different running sessions and, you know, it used to blow me away how much he knew about, you know, what players would be able to sustain, you know, a certain running intensity and, um, you know, now that feels second nature, but back then it was great to have a, a, a mentor through secondary school and just post to, to support my understanding in that space. And uh, the second person was uh, Mark McKeon, who um, was working within the AFL industry and got me to support him with his corporate health business and at the Collingwood Football Club at the okay. time that he yeah. was working at. Um, so, you know, just getting some. You know, people that I was able to connect with, uh, they saw the passion that I had and they allowed me to grow a network within an industry that, um, you know, I've been able to work in. Yeah, oh, it's, it's a great uh, great story. And the, the, the role of those role models is important for everyone. Martin, do you have a couple of questions? Yeah, so you worked at Richmond for many years. I know that yep. because I'm my nephews, I had a few photos with Dusty and your son, obviously. Um, yes, that's right. But during those times, there was a lot of times, obviously, where Richmond were a bit more of a battling club than what they currently are. How did you find your time at the Tigers, and did you work your way up through the ranks, or did you start right at the top? Uh, yeah, so to answer the second part, I worked my way through the ranks. I um, uh, originally got to know a guy, Dr Noel Duncan, at the Collingwood Football Club. He was the first full-time conditioning coach uh, at Collingwood. Um, back in the late 90s and so I worked part-time with him at Collingwood and then we after um, going our separate ways for a few years at, at different clubs and I, I cut my teeth at uh, um, Geelong Football Club and Port Adelaide Football Club in uh, various roles and then uh, Noel started at the Tigers and asked me to 
come back and join him. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I basically was his assistant uh, for the first maybe five years of that um, my tenure at the Tigers, and and then I took over as the high performance manager there. And um, it it's uh, been quite. Um, very dependent on the senior coach, as as most football clubs are in terms of the, um, you know, the environment, and and so the first period was with Danny Frawley, and um, yeah, he he created an outstanding environment that was one of really strong connections and a real passion. Uh, the players loved playing with him. Um, early days, you know, we made it into a preliminary final. We're beaten up in Brisbane by. Uh, Brisbane that went on to win three in a row um, and you know that was a pretty exciting and fun time relatively early in my career um, and looking back on it now made you know creates a real understanding as to what makes good organisations um, yeah. successful through connection and it was one of Danny's absolute strengths as a as a person and you know fairly tragic times in the last 12 mm. months um, you know, with what happened uh, to, to Spud, but um, yeah, he he was ahead of ahead, ahead of his time in relation to the the emotional connection he created within a group, and uh, and then we went through a pretty lean patch um, for for a number of years, and that was hard work. You know, that that was some challenging political times within the within the football club, um, but again, looking back on those tough times made me realise. Um, you know uh, what? What are some of the things you want to avoid as an organisation? And it felt like there was quite a bit of blame at times in 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 that environment. It was quite political, and uh, there was a lot of uh, emotion, but it wasn't you know overly well controlled, and it certainly wasn't a connected, united feeling back then. Yeah. Um, and then Damien Harwood came on board and was you know outstanding. You know, I, I loved the three years I had with, with uh, Dimmer and and that coaching group. Um, you know, we were developing a young team of, you know, the likes of, you know, Trent Cotchin and, and, and Dustin Martin and um, Shane Edwards and Jack Rewald and Alex Rance, et cetera. And, and so it was a pretty exciting crew coming through. And, um, you know, I really enjoyed my time there, but I got to a point where I'd been there for 12 years and... I needed to challenge myself with something different and it's probably the way my mind operates that you know I'd like to keep searching for new challenges and um, and and you know uh, not sitting in a comfort zone as such um, and it was a tough decision to leave football but I was offered a great opportunity to start a business um, through connections in football and you know, I, I certainly learnt a lot through that process and loved that challenge um, uh, and, and then have been lured back into, into football since, which I which I still love and, yeah. and, and are super passionate about. Yeah, I think one of those one of those new experiences for you was probably was uh, was training Ash Barty and um, yeah. and obviously in a completely different sport, an individual sport, I'm sure different uh, focuses for you as a trainer and obviously different challenges for you uh, if, if you're involved in the travel side of the tennis circuit and things like that. Um, but just how was life you know, on the tennis circuit while uh, training Ash and did you include uh, a lot of what you already knew through footy uh, in her training regime? Yeah, I, I, I'm, uh, firstly I didn't, um, I didn't travel with Ash. I, um, uh, we did our work remotely. There was discussion about potentially doing some of that but uh yeah it was difficult for me with work commitments i had back in melbourne and um my relationship started with ash when she was about 15 and her coach was a friend of mine uh jason stoltenberg who is a terrific coach and uh really well regarded in the tennis world and was a very good player himself and um he asked if i could um if he could bring down a young Aussie girl who was really talented um, and just loves her football, uh, loves the Tigers, and so Ash came down and uh, spent some time at the Richmond Footy Club, um, you know, just getting to know the way we operated and how to prepare as an athlete, and 
um, and she loved that. And, and so I did some prep work with her um, during the Australian summer. Um, and as part of that, it was getting Ash to spend time with some of the Richmond guys who were in their off season at the time. Uh, and she would do running sessions with Dusty and Koch and Basha Hooley and, and, and the like, and uh, she just loved that. She loved the whole team ethos, um, found tennis was tough at that time. Yeah, she was a lot of nights away from home, mm, um, yeah. and yeah, was still a young girl with high expectations, and, um, and, and not long after that, she stepped away from tennis, which has become really quite a famous story and uh, recent Australian sport um, and you know I don't work with Ash these days but you know have a friendship with her and um, just love seeing how well she's going knowing the quality of person she is so you know we, we chat occasionally and and you know message um, uh, as she's on the road and check in with her but she's she's doing an amazing job and a great person yeah, obviously, and a great role model she is now to us, to all Australians. Uh, so you're now the high performance manager at the Saints, which I would imagine, uh, you know, you you're in control of all aspects of the medical and uh, the fitness side of things. Uh, do you get your hands dirty a lot still, or um, do you uh, get actively involved in the programs that the the players are setting? And uh, yep. I suppose even more so now, are you involved with? Um, or how heavily are you involved in monitoring what they're doing while they're away from the club? Yeah, it's um, yeah, strange times at the moment managing elite athletes, but um, yeah, certainly my role has evolved to being less hands-on in recent years and more uh, overseeing and managing a program and uh, communicating with the various stakeholders um, you know, within a football program uh, and particularly strong communication with the senior coach uh, around the way we want to operate. Um, so that's a big part of my role these days in recent years um, and still a small amount of hands-on. Um, but I have a, you know, an amazing team of, you know, some of the absolute leaders in world sport in regards to conditioning and medical and welfare um, that work in the team that I'm involved in. So, um, you know, it means that I don't need to be as hands-on. Um, but, you know, interestingly, that, that's a fair chance to change, you know, in, in, the, in the short term yeah, because absolutely. of the financial implications as, as has been heavily advertised. And so, um, you know, it, it may mean, you know, quite possibly and more likely than not that I'll be more hands-on um, in the future. Um, which is fine. You know, I love that connection with the players. You know, uh, certainly something that allowed me to develop really good re relationships with a number of the Richmond guys, um, working with them closely for, for many years. Um, and, you know, something that I, you know, still look forward to if, uh, if it needs to go down that path yep, in the yeah. future. Yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll ask you one more Ash Barty question. It's just come to my mind, sure. but when she, one that you know, and you said yeah, you did have a working relationship. Now it's more a friendship. You must have yep. been up to all hours at French Open final, watching every point. Just you know, what I mean, and you know, it was pretty comprehensive yep. score. But you know, and just to to see yep. someone's dreams come true like that, that must have been an amazing night. Yeah, I, like it's um, you know, it's hard when you're in Australia and and you're uh, trying to consume sport in the Northern Hemisphere, um, and particularly when you're then getting up to work. Um, you know your day job so you know it, it, it's about trying to get the balance and I prioritise sleep massively it's such an important part of performance for, for all of us not just athletes and um, you know but at the same time um, you know to see friends and people that you've got a lot of time for be able to achieve things like that it's not going to happen too often so yeah I, I just loved that and, and not just the French but you know just watching her compete in other tournaments and, and try and, you know, if I can't see it live, um, you know, I'll, I'll often keep an eye on the um, WTA app and follow the progress of, of games um, and certainly, you know, if I wake up the next morning and know that Ash has played overnight, you know, it would be one of the first things I'll check in the Australian morning. doing the phone, yeah, that's... Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah it's, it's great to, you know, 
watch and and yeah, look, I don't annoy Ash too much, and she probably gets annoyed <laughs> by, by a whole lot of people these days. Yeah. You know, being world number one, but um, yeah, I certainly love to you know keep an eye on it. Yeah. Now, if you had a crystal ball, Matt, and you know, looking twenty years into the future with with what an AFL footballer would look like. Uh, I suppose I look 20 years back, you've got your, your, your big full forwards that don't have great turning circles are almost extinct. What do you yep. think in 20 years' time, uh, you know I mean, an AFL footballer might look like? Yeah, I, I think there might be an evolution a little bit sooner even than 20 years. And, um, you know, I, I think the changes that are going to be forced upon the game this year uh, may shape the way it looks in the short to medium term as well. And, yeah. and that being... You know, a shorter length of game, which I'm supportive of. Um, you know, potentially less games in the season. Potentially, certainly in the in the near future, shorter turnaround between games. I don't think that will be something that's sustained. But yeah. um, I, I think the uh, the reduced workload from yeah you know, 120 to you know 125 minutes down to 95 to 100 minute games uh, is a significant reduction um, for a really physically demanding sport yeah um, and that helps some of those types that aren't as uh, aerobically efficient and um, all have you know excellent repeat speed speed endurance yeah. um, so it can lend itself to you know a, a um, you know, a, a power forward as such, like the old days, yeah. being able to stay at home a little bit more. Yeah. Um, you know, often that's dictated by the way the coaches want the team to defend as well. And, it, yeah, defence never included the key forward 20 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Um, and now it includes every, you know, every one of 18 players on the ground mm. uh, have, a, have a role to play in defence. So um, I think the tactical changes will be really interesting to watch um and you know that is something that i'm discussing with our coaches you know fairly regularly because it, it often shapes the way we need to condition certain players um and i'm really interested to see the outcome of potentially reduced gains in season and certainly reducing minutes in a game um you know and and i think a part of that flow on will be quite possibly reduce pre-season length which yeah. for most players is not a bad thing um, but there are certainly athletes that really rely on structure and routine and um, you know more time away in holiday mode yeah. um, can be a higher risk for them you know physically and emotionally so it's just yeah there's a bit bit to work through as an industry over the coming years yeah. um the one thing that hasn't changed much over the journey that I've been involved in, it's still a damn hard sport physically. It's still a sport that, you know, I, I sort of think of them as an analogy, more like rally cars versus F1s. Yeah. Um, you know, an F1's got great speed, power, uh, agility, you know, acceleration, but, you know, highly temperamental. You know, we, we need rally cars that, you know, that have very good endurance, very good speed, very good agility, very good power, but mm. you know, they can absorb punishment and keep backing up. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. One question, that, sorry, go on. No, I was going to say that's one thing that hasn't changed. I think in yeah. 20 years it'll still be a feature of the game. Yeah. Now, well, one thing I'll pick you, uh, want to pick your brain on there that you, you said you work with the head coach. I imagine, you know, again, 20, 30 years ago, the, the head trainer, for, for a better word, I'll get them fit, there you go, coach, you do what you want with them. And and now is it a bit more, okay, well, what style of system? The, the coach dictates what style he wants and then communicates with you to get players ready for his system. Is that is that been a bit of an evolution in, in your time? Yeah, no, I, I, it's never as black and white as that. You know, yeah. it's, it's, um, it's certainly a much more collaborative approach to conditioning these days. Um and and there's there's still room to move there. You know, it's it's something that we've spoken about quite frequently as a club as to you know how do we um, you know minimise any siloed approach to preparation and, yeah. and really work in collaboration across you know tactical, physical, psychological. You know, how do we design a program that 
um, weaves all three in and out consistently and yeah. um, you know that it's not me and my team focusing purely on the physical for a percentage of the program and then you know the coaches the tactical it's yeah how do we best manage all of that and it's definitely improved and I the introduction of GPS technology over the last certainly decade and a bit more um, has helped that enormously because you can monitor you know intensities and workload within football specific sessions as opposed to needing a set distance and a clock in running sessions all the time yeah um, so the technology has has helped that shift as well yeah you yeah, know it's an interesting one because I know even in the last few years there's always been uh, the talk that sometimes the the high performance managers had too much power uh, according to the coaches, because uh, obviously not letting guys do that extra little bit of training based on what they've covered and things like that. So the fact yeah. that the communications improved is obviously something to to, to uh, make the whole um, the yeah. whole fitness side of things all come together. Um, yeah. Just just getting back to Hale now. Obviously, we we, we deal with a lot of um, young guys and teenagers. Uh, what yeah. would your advice be on fitness and and well being, was which is so important these days? Um, if if they were looking at pursuing elite sport, we've had some come through recently. I think you've got a, a exhale boy at St Kilda at the moment, Sam Alabacus. Yeah, big Sal, that's correct. He's back in Perth at the moment, big uh, Sam, and yeah, uh, he's a yeah, good character. And it's an interesting one because he he didn't play a truckload of footy when he was at Hale, so he's been a, he's a tall boy and he, he was a late developer. Yeah. So, what would your advice be to uh, the boys coming through? Yeah, I, I think. Um, you know, a well-rounded approach to preparation is is essential. And if you think about, you know, as as an athlete, there are three things that you can work on, and that's one is your craft, so your skill, um, and and you know, if you in a footy context, that's you know your your actual football skill and craft. And the second is your physical conditioning, uh, and then the third is your psychological conditioning, and. Um, if you don't have elements of all three involved in your preparation, then you're missing a piece of the puzzle. And probably the one that has been missed most consistently over the journey has been the psychological piece. Um, certainly the, the craft and the physical prep is you know pretty common to most of us. Um, but there's been a really positive shift uh, around psychological training mental strength training um and you know i'm sure that most of your students have seen some of that evolution uh both at the at the school but also you know hearing about it with elite athletes and uh, it's still an area that needs to grow a lot um but if you're not focusing on those three and if you if you can look at your week and say i am working on my skill I'm working on my physical condition and I'm working on my mind um, in any given week. Then you've got a good, uh, you know, a good structure, a good setup, and you're going to maximise your capacity. Yeah, perfect. Now uh, we're nearly at the end, so I'll just being a team player and uh, is vital, obviously, behind the scenes at a footy club and uh, on the field. Is there anyone sort of that you've noticed in your time in the AFL, either at Richmond, who you've, or at the Saints, who you've just thought to yourself? This guy is just an unbelievable team player, only focused on uh, where the team wants to go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's quite a few over the journey. Um, you know, I've been really fortunate to work with, you know, some, some amazing athletes um, and, you know, going all the way back to two brothers that not many of your students may have heard of in Andrew and Duncan Calloway that were just all about whatever was needed for the team um, and that even extended to their contracts you know and how much they got paid you know that they would you know they would be much more worried about will this work for the team than what can I get for myself um, and it was the way they played as well the game that they were the exact same mindset you know whatever their coach needed them to do whatever their teammates needed them to do and um, so that that's I mean, yeah, you know, it doesn't matter whether you know those guys or not. Um, you know, knowing that, having that mentality, mm. just meant that the level of respect that they had back then and still have now as people 
um, it, you know, is enormous. And even though they're maybe not highly profiled names in in you know Australian football, yeah. um, and and through to you know modern day, you know, I like, you know, spend quite a bit of time with Trent Cotchin still, and he's a good yeah. friend and and uh, another um, captain in the AFL, Jaron Geary at the Saints, um, who you know they're just so focused on how do I make the team better and it's why they're captains it's why they're good captains um, you know Koch has obviously got a lot more added, um, uh, you know compliments over the last couple of years the way he's captain but you know seeing Jaron Geary firsthand as well has just been so impressive because it's often through those hard times that you see how really good leaders um, you know manage a group and uh, you know both of them are more worried about how they can make their teammates better than they are about, you know, getting individual accolades and looking at their own stats post game. Yeah. You know, their, their, their first question will be, you know, what do we need to do to get better collectively, as opposed to some athletes I've seen will go straight online and have a look at what <laughs> social media comments have been made about them or uh, how many yeah. text marks or handballs they yeah. had in the game. Yeah, it's amazing, Matt. That you're, I think you're about the seventh person we've interviewed from di- in different, you know, players, coaches, <coughs> who've yeah. asked that same question to, and all lead back pretty much to the captains. You know, what I mean, it's like it's such a non-negotiable um, character trait to become a leader that you care yeah. about others. And and you know, I mean, from a couple of Port Adelaide ga- ga- guys about. Um, Jonas to um, yeah. even a test cricketer talking about Ricky Ponting, like just the similarities in leadership um, yeah. and, and it being the number one thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it's uh, absolutely critical and it's been consistent across every good captain, good leader that I've seen in sport. Yeah, now last question on a lighthearted note here, uh, yeah. Matt, that we have uh, Pie Day here at Hale and I know this is going to be a little bit controversial for you to even admit you've eaten a pie maybe. Hopefully this doesn't get back to your playing list, but um, <laughs> boarders kind of do some kind of weird things to pies in terms of what sauce, and they eat them with a spoon and a fork or with a roof or without a roof. Hypothetically, yeah. and we'll just say in a hypothetical world where the high-performance manager at St Kilda did actually eat a pie, how would you eat it? I it'd be pretty easy for me. I, I'd, I'd peel the roof off just to let a bit of the heat out and put a bit of tomato sauce in. Then I'll put the roof back down, add a bit more tomato sauce, and then I'd go for it. Yeah, well, I can't say it's not a disappointing answer. That's very much like a border here. Uh, that's not what we were hoping for. The interview would have been short if we asked that question first, but that's all right. Yeah, that's yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, on yeah. a serious note, Matt, mate, really appreciate you giving up a bit of time. I know, um, you know you're... Work life's obviously very different at the moment, and but you're still as busy as ever. So hopefully we, uh, your family stays safe down there in uh, Melbourne and we can see you uh, and, and the St Kilda Footy Club back out there pretty quickly. Yeah, good on you, Luke. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, good thanks very much, Matt, for taking the time. Uh, no worries at all. Anytime.